wait a minute. So I printed out for myself the homework. So, uh, for example, sometimes uh, there's a couple problems where it just depends on your choice of what symbols to use. So especially the population ones where they talk about birth rate, death rate. Uh, so normally I have a rate of change. So this is your regular, this is your like base level first attempt. And then you start improving this. So the first improvement is in the homework. Well, obviously... You know, it's not, it can't be just a constant increase or decrease. There's competing things happening, right? So this itself is a rate of change of population. The birth rate would be a rate of change of population that's positive, obviously. And then the death rate is the opposite. So uh, you would have, uh, so what do you think? What would be a, a, a nice way to represent the birth rate? And the cool thing is I could call this, uh, uh, a, right? A could represent DPTT. So when you want to figure out how do I represent birth rate, you can just call it B. It's amazing, and you can call death rate D. I love it. And they tell you that the key in that problem is the last statement. Pretty much gives it away. They say, which one am I looking at? Oh, determine a model for the population of both the birth rate and the death rate are proportional to the population present, right? which on the surface makes sense. So the birth rate is proportional to the population present. So what would that, what would go here? No. So I would say K1P, for example. All right, that's all I'm gonna say. I've already said too much. I kind of keep going with that exact idea. The last statement actually gives you where to start in this problem. They tell you the birth rate and the death rate are both proportional. Now, why did I say K1? Because the death rate, they don't necessarily have to have the same constant, right? They could be varying factors. That makes one more weighted than the other one. Cool, I like it. All right, so that kind of gives you an idea for both that one and number three. Number three just involves the same thing, just put a square in the right place. Right. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody have, Hopefully everybody's gotten into 1-3, and that might be why several of you were really concerned, but uh, like number six is a neat one because that kind of takes you back to your pre-calc days, your trig days, trying to interpret. Because the, what's Newton's law of cooling, it says the rate of change of temperature is, I don't know if you guys, you don't have to, by the way, I'm not going to make you memorize those formulas in section 1-3 if, you, if you're worried about that. <laughs> My main purpose, the main purpose was to show you, make you kind of read through and see where things kind of come from. How do I kind of force you to really read through, give you a few problems that aren't just surface level? So yeah, there's some problems in there that you've got to incorporate new information into the formula. So you've got to go back and freaking read and understand what the formula means in the first place. Right? You don't have to understand all of physics and all of uh, uh, population dynamics and so forth to do these problems. Um, it would help, but... You don't have to. Uh, but this is Newton's law of cooling. It's proportional to the difference. Right? And, and then the whole thing for this problem, number six, is really just figure out an expression for TM from what they give you. Right? So they tell you that TM is not constant. It's varying over time. So you just got to figure out what the formula is from the equation. And I love it. It's just what's the phase shift, what's the amplitude, what's all that kind of business, if there's a phase shift, depending on what function you want to use. All right, maybe, maybe. Okay, so six is, is kind of straightforward. Um, what's another one that gave people trouble? Hopefully nine isn't too bad. Right? There, there's two levels to this. I want you to realize, if I have a, a, a even like a, uh, like this, Uh, one level of, I could solve this differential equation and figure out a function y of x, right? Uh, y is the function of x. Or I could just use this, and that's a variable, that's a variable, that's a variable, that's a variable. Right? I mean, that's another level of this. I know the rate of change of the rate of change of y with respect to x. And I know those values at a certain snapshot of time. I can throw them in the equation and solve for the thing I don't know. Right? That's another level of this equation is, 
don't even solve for y, just use these as their own variables, right? Okay, okay, maybe. Um, 12, 12 is interesting, but I, nobody asked me about 12, so I'm just going to let you guys look at 12. 15, huh? 12 is the one about concentration of brine in a tank. So there are some examples that kind of skirt around that one. So I'm going to let you guys look at that one. Uh, 15 is a little bit freaky. Somebody came to me and I kind of started to overthink this, but then I realized you're not supposed to know any physics to do this problem. So it's, um, Kirchhoff just says the, the voltage has to equal the voltage drop. So it kind of makes sense. I mean, in any closed loop of a circuit, however much voltage going in has got to equal how much voltage is dropped across all the various components. And this one, you're just missing the capacitance. So that term just goes away. The key is the, the differential equation they give you is in terms of Q, blah, 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 right? And this one asks, the, so the, this problem is really just drop the capacitance term. Just drop it. There is no capacitor, so just drop it. But if you read the question, it wants you, it doesn't want it Q of T. It wants I of T. But you know what I is. I, who remembers or who knows? Current, you know, if it's flowing faster, that means that the little, there's more electrons going. And if I represent charge with Q, it's the rate of change of Q with respect to time. So then what's D squared Q dt squared in terms of I? I DI. Yeah, DI dt. Right? It's just another derivative on top of this, so it's DI dt. And then there's a DQ dt term in the next thing, right, that relates to the uh, resistance. So that you just replace with I. So then you have a differential equation that would lead to I of T. This differential equation they give you in the, in the write-up would lead to Q of T. So they just ask you, all right, take it a level up, make it I of T. I love it. And then, okay. uh, so if you haven't tried that one out yet, uh, hopefully uh, you've written that down. That might come. Make more sense if you actually start working on it. Um, 18 is freaky. When you first read through it, it's a little bit freaky. What I want you to realize is uh, what they're trying to do with number 18. That's the one about Newton's second law and Archimedes' principle. And again, you start to read through this and you're like, was I supposed to take physics before I took this? No. Uh, what they're trying to do is they're trying to take a, a, a given known situation and then putting something else in place. So any function and any differential equation where there's a force in it, I can replace that expression with the force that's in the situation. So what's providing the force here is the buoyancy, right? It's related to how much volume of the thing is under the water, and then that's going to relate to how much force up there is. Okay, maybe, maybe. So I start with... Uh, Newton's second law, and in this case, I'm going to put a y there, right, because that's specifically, we're talking about the y uh, movement, uh, and that's going to equal to, that's my force, right? So i got to figure out an expression for the force, but they tell you, this is the key, uh, buoyancy, or upward force of the water there is equal to the weight of the water displaced. So if I can figure out the volume of the water displaced. And they tell you the diameter of the little barrel. They tell you uh, the Y of T is the height that's underneath the water. So can you figure out the volume of that little piece, right? So here's a little, like, pathetic little cylinder. Here's the stuff. So here's the amount that's under the water below. It should be below the equilibrium thing. So here's the equilibrium point. So this is going to be Y of T. I need to figure out the volume of that piece, and they tell you the diameter. I think they tell you as S, right? There you go. Cool. I like it. Cool. I like it. So you just need to figure out the volume of that piece and bring into play the density. I don't know if you guys, even if you don't know the formula for density and volume and so forth, you can figure it out from the units that they have. Okay, maybe. And also, I think the example talks about, there's an example with density in it. Um, okay. 
So that's really all this problem is, is this force is being supplied by the buoyancy. So if you can figure out the expression for the buoyancy, throw it in there. And then who remembers, who knows? They don't tell you the mass, they tell you it's the weight. So I'll, I'll give you this. Uh, and, and they talk about this too in the write-up, but mg is the weight. So you can replace m with weight divided by g. Where g, g is what? What's g? Well, you know, on the earth at some certain point. I don't know if you realize that g is less if you have, if you live in the mountains. Because the mass of the mountains actually pulls you up a little bit. Up a little bit. Right? Don't get too excited. <laughs> um, all right, so hopefully that's enough to get you started. But do you start to see the way you're supposed to look at some of these problems is they gave me a general idea. I've got to replace parts of it with a specific situation I'm in. That's the way a lot of these mathematical models work. What's supplying the force? That's what I put in place of the F in the equation. Um, I don't think there's too much after that. 21, 21 sounds a little bit freaky at first, but I will, I'll give you this. If you look at the example, the, the main difference with 21 and the example in the book is you got to love a problem where they define something within the problem. I had a teacher that would define something on the test and then ask us a question on, about that. And, I'm not going to do that to you because I still, to this day, hate this. He's like, the test is a part of the learning experience. We're like, no, a test, it's the test of the learning experience. Right? Uh, here's a problem that explains something within it. Um, and why does this make sense? I mean, if you look back at what the force is before, the mass is a constant. But if I'm gonna, if I got a rocket, it's got fuel. As the rocket blasts off, what's happening to the fuel? It's burning off. So then the mass of the rocket is getting less. Right? So that's going to affect its motion. So you don't take that into account and you get who knows what happens. Um, so, so I'll give you this part. Uh, what was it? Then? So if you read the, the, um, the book, this part is the pull down on the rocket. This part is, is the what? It's related to the velocity you're traveling at. So the faster you go, the bigger this piece of the force is. That's what's called the drag. Right? And this part is actually why ants can survive high falls. Right? It's related to terminal velocity. And, uh, anyway, so little ant survives and we don't quite survive. And then this will be, they tell us that the, the rocket provides this much thrust. So that's going to be a, a positive component. You're getting that much thrust. And these are the ones that are trying to pull you back down to earth. The drag is saying, oh shit, all the air coming on. <laughs> I don't think. The rocket is doing that. Whoa! And uh, and then this, of course, is your regular, you know, the Earth saying, "Come back." Right. Uh, this. Let me think. Yes, that is uh, where you've got to work with this. And of course, if m and v are both dependent on t, this is just going to use. What is this? This is m times v. So to do this derivative, I have to use product. Mm -hmm. I like it. Right? Whereas if you look, if you assume m is constant, then that's where you get m dv dt, which is ma. Force equals ma. If I don't, if I can't assume m is constant, I have to pick up another term. Dm dt would normally be zero, but now it's not zero because it's changing over time. I like it. I like it. I like it. Okay. So I get another evil problem is like a chain hanging over, and as it falls, more of it is hanging over, so that mass that's being affected by gravity is not constant. And oh shit, that's kind of related to that. I always hated mass changing over time. All right, all right. Uh, and then I think the last one, the last one I'm going to let you look at. I like the last one. The last one's that little thought experiment about telling through the Earth, and you can go to the website that shows you where you'd pop out if you did that. All right. Uh, I don't know if you ever, have you ever heard of that? Like if you try to tunnel through, would you go to China? No. Right. Most of us would just pop out in the water. Yeah. That would be interesting. Okay, so does that make you feel a little bit better? Or if you haven't even started it, you're like, shit, I didn't know it was going to involve that. Oh, I love you guys. You're like, 
Don't tell them anything. <laughs> Don't give away anything. All right. Any, anything left over from 1112 or anything on 13 that still lingering doubts about? Anything left over from 1112? Those were hopefully pretty straightforward. Okay. So what I want to do is 2-2 uh, two, two will be semi-quick. And then I want to kind of start 2-3. And then you know, I get to a point, I, I just see if we can move early, maybe. It's good to be the teacher. I can do that for myself if I want to. Um, we already talked a little bit about 2-2. Two, two. It's a separable equation stuff. Um, so, for example, you know, so, so a separable equation would look like this. I always hated these kind of representations, because they're just kind of gross. The idea is simpler than that makes it seem. It's, you got a function of x and a function of y that you can separate, right? So you can get all your y stuff on one side and all your x stuff on the other side, right? So I, here I could do dy over hy equals g of x times d of x, and then I could integrate both sides. And you pray to God that h of y is something nice. Maybe the reciprocal is easy. That would be nice. So, for example, uh, let me give you one that's not quite in this form, just because I'm evil. Now, what's interesting is if you know a little bit of Diffie-Q, or you've taken like 281 where they talk about some Diffie-Q stuff, gotta be careful about bringing stuff in too early. Right? You gotta know what class you're in and what you know at a given time. Um, this we're looking at as separable, right? Uh, there are there are a lot of differential equations that are in multiple forms at once. And in fact, we'll see one here in a minute. Um, with all that aside, is this separable? Yeah, because yeah, I can add it over and then divide, and get everything. The, uh, hopefully, obviously, the d's have to be up on top, right? Doesn't make any damn sense for them to be on the bottom. So what would you end up with here? Uh, the dy, dy over y, over y. Over and that's going to be relatively easy. And let's see the part that everybody always forgets. I don't know. You got to love a comment like that. Yeah, there you go. Got to cover our ass for, I mean, 1 over y, that function has what domain? I mean, you a range, who cares? What are you allowed to use? Everything except 0. zero. zero. Okay. Uh, if I didn't put the absolute value, the, the range or the domain of ln of y would be 0 to infinity, not including 0. That, they don't match. That's not fair. So this is a way to make them match. And then it all depends on... What side of zero is the integral on? And since I don't know, I have to cover my ass and just put an absolute value. Maybe, maybe. So then what would this side be? Uh, Hopefully the guys are cool that, I mean, I just have to put the one C down there. I can just collect it all on that one side. Now in general, well, this actually allows us to do this either way, to be honest. It didn't specify which variable I'm considering to be dependent and independent, but it's already kind of set up. I, I sort of did this by a habit. We solve for y normally, right? And this is a function of x over there, so screw it. Let's solve for y. What do you get when you try to solve for y? Yeah, you get e to the ln 1 plus x plus c. I'm adding power, so of course I could rewrite that a certain way. How can I rewrite this? I can't bring it down. So a smart choice here would be to call this C1 until you don't have to call it that anymore, right? So what is E to the C1? It is just... It's just a constant. constant. So now I can call this C. 
E, and what's E to the ln of that? And the absolute values are really not necessary here because that would just change the sign of this, and it's a freaking constant. It's whatever the hell it needs to be, so it sucks that in. Is that, is that cool? Let me stop there for a second. On one level, it should be kind of exciting. I know this is not the most exciting problem, but we're finally freaking getting the answers ourselves. Now, given the solution, oh, how'd you get that solution? Uh, and this is the most direct type. Separable is something you've done already. You just didn't realize it at the time. You, you did it before. Okay, I like it. Cool. Okay. Um, how about this one? I, I think we talked about possibly this one exactly before. I don't know if I want to go all the way through this because we did one like this. This is just pointing out a certain thing that we talked about before. Can somebody tell me, first off, is this separable? So, can, But can you get all the x stuff on one side, all the y stuff on the other, where the dy dx is on top? Yes, you totally can, right, because there's very little x stuff. So it, it really, in fact, I mean, to be honest, this is separable. Right, just multiply dx, and there you go, I separated them, look at me. You guys kind of with me? So, so to not be separable means you can't untangle the x and y into separate functions. So if I had, if I had dy dx equals e to the xy, I'm, I'm plus natural log of x minus y, I mean, holy shit, can you separate the x and y stuff? Here you can, maybe. Not really. Ah. And here you can't either. So they're kind of like backwards. If this was e to the x plus y, then you could do it. I like it. All right, all right. So what was my point? That, that is certainly separable. But who remembers what else we call this? The derivative is only dependent on the dependent uh, variable. So it starts with an h. Um, not homogeneous. No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. It starts with an A. Autonomous, I think. I'm sorry. I'm way ahead of myself. So this is also autonomous. Now, what was it about autonomous stuff that we talked about? That, that dealt with the phase portraits and all that kind of stuff. But the most basic thing about them, if I don't ask you to make a phase portrait, the most basic thing about it is they have trivial solutions you want to take care of first. They have uh, constant solutions, possibly. Right? Because if I can make this side zero using a constant, then that side is going to be automatically zero because it's a derivative. So of course you can see, what would the two solutions be? The two? Zero, zero, two, 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 and negative two. Two and negative two. Zero doesn't work. So yeah, y equals two, y equals negative two. Now how would you get the other solutions, the whole family of solutions that exist other than that? We, we did a problem like this before. And it had to do with something that you guys love that comes from pre-calc. Partial fractions, right? Because you could, how do I separate this dy over that equals dx? Right? Then you integrate that. I can use partial fractions on. I'm not going to do that. We did that already. So this is showing you why if you, you want to take a second to make sure if it's autonomous or not before you start attacking it with some method. Because if it's autonomous, you've got to get those answers real quick if there are. If that was a plus four, and we're not dealing with, you don't want complex differential equations yet. Right, so we're not going to allow for complex solutions uh, yet. Okay. You guys semi with me? So if it's autonomous, you want to take a second and get those answers, and then apply whatever procedure is going to work. Um, blah, 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 blah. Okay. I, I, let me really quickly make sure. That's all the notes I had for 2, 2, but I think... Separable, when it's separable, you're like, uh, thank the gods. There is one little thing, which is kind of silly. Um, there sometimes there are going to be situations where your answer is an integral function. Meaning, I mean, something the easiest example would be. I mean, at this point function like that, e to the x squared, e to the negative x squared, you should know it's going to have some major trouble with integration. So 
So this would end up being integral dy equals integral e negative x squared dx. You guys, you guys with me? So we get y equals whatever the shit this is plus c, you know. So, I mean, you can have answers that aren't satisfactory, but they're still the answer. I mean, you get an integral function answer, right? And some of you guys might remember, what can we do with this if we really wanted to, or even if you didn't want to? I don't know if you guys remember, what can you do with this? If you do something with this, you can represent e to negative squared using a long ass thing in the tail. Yeah, oh shit, right? Oh yeah, and then you can integrate it in its summation notation form. Do you remember, you remember integrating summation notation form? Yeah, oh, it's in your future. Just to, Right now, we'll just stop there. But later we'll talk about series solutions to differential equations. Okay, you're so happy. Um, all right, so the last little piece that I want to talk about is, is uh, some, I, mean, I just want to set up the motivation behind uh, section 2.3. Um, uh, and I want to do that in a way that normally isn't done. Ah, oh, screw that. Let me just erase this. So we got that part over there. It's just easier if I. So we got what they want here. More than you wanted. Okay. Let me, let me show you this. This is, this is kind of nice. If, if I gave you a differential equation like this, and actually, even before I do this, let me ask you this. If I had this, uh, it doesn't matter. Sure. Do you understand this? That pops up every now and again, no? But what's integral dy? What's integral dt? So what's integral d that? That one. All right, all right, see, so that's nice. So if I could represent something as the uh, differential of some function, that would be kick ass, right? So and, and real quick, just to take a step back, um, wouldn't this be that? And how would you do this? How, how would you, how would you do this? No, don't, don't, oh, don't overthink it. Nothing amazing. How do you take the derivative? It would just involve the. Yeah, yeah. So it'd be two x y plus. I'm not integrating anything, right? Taking the derivative. Plus x squared. Dy dx equals one. So if I had this. If I had this, I could go back a step. I could actually realize that that can go together. So let me show you the one I was about to show you. If they gave you a differential equation that started like this. Here's a, here's a nice disgusting one. Okay, so if, if that was my differential equation, this does not happen often. And, and uh, the motivation I'm trying to set up for you, you you'll see in a minute, what's kind of like extra here that normally wouldn't kind of be there would be like this x to the negative 2, right? All right, so let, let's deal with what this is right now. Do you notice how that looks a lot like this? So can you work backwards? Where would that have come from? Well, obviously there's going to be a y. And you know what the other function is? This is leaving the function alone, derivative of the y, so that must be here. And does it work? What's the derivative of x to negative 2? Negative 2x to negative 3. So that is that. I threw them all together. I realized that uh, that uh, this, these two pieces are actually the product rule parts of this. And why is that nice? Because this is easy as shit to integrate, because the answer is just staring me in the face. And on the other side, I just have cosine just hanging out, right? Where to leave off? Oh, my poor little dx. Is that cool? Multiply the dx up. 
So let me, let's take a step back, make sure everybody's with me. So this, I can pull together as d by dx of this. And then I can multiply the dx up. And again, what am I doing when I do that? I'm, I'm kind of still separating in a sense. But I'm not separating dy dx, I'm separating d, this shit, in dx. Right? So now I can put the dx over there. Integrate. What do you get on this side? x and negative 2y, by definition. Equals sine x. Let's see. And then you can just multiply by x squared and get the answer. This is kind of nifty. I like this. y equals x squared sine x plus cx squared. I mean, that's kind of a weird placement for the constant. Do you see what I mean? Let me stop for a second. You've sort of seen this in some of the work, but this is the first time that we've worked a problem out. Do you know what? It, do you see what I mean by that? We don't normally see cx squared like that. Just this doesn't have any constant term applied to it, and this is multiplied by a constant. We're not used to that from comp one or two. This is the more general use of constants. They could just pop up who knows where. So, so how would this problem? This is not the way the problem is going to look in this section two, three, right? The problem would have started off like this. Right? It would have started off like that. So the, the, the idea of how to work with these, and let me ask you this real quick, what kind of DE, tell me anything you can about that DE, the way I've written it there. Anything you can. I'll accept whatever's true oh, about it. It's written in black ink, yes. <laughs> first order, I love it, so first order. Linear, that's the big one. So if you look at section two, three, it's all about method to work with linear DEs. Oh, you just sound, oh. It's ordinary, or uh, um, it's an ODE. Yes, there's no partials. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, yeah. I like it. I like it. So it's an ODE, not a PDE. I like it. Sweet. It, and it's linear. Why is it linear? Because this is setting up that Y is my variable I'm looking at, and this is linear in Y. There's no nonlinear in Y functions. In there. I like it. I like it. So 2, 3 is all about what to do when you have linear. And so the idea with linear equations is to figure out what to multiply everything by. You see, if I knew to multiply everything by x to the negative 2 so that this would happen, do you see how that's related? There's got to be a method to use what's here to figure out what to multiply by so this kind of thing happens. And what's beautiful is if it's uh, first order linear like this, there is a method that will work. Period. Now, the method itself involves integration, so you could end up with something semi-disgusting in there, right? But still, there's a method that will work for it. And it's something called integrating factor. You use an integrating factor to figure this out. Um, it's kind of a method that's, uh, I don't know if I ever want to say this, but it's sort of going away a little bit, but it's still useful. So the whole idea of behind 2, 3 is to come up with a way. And, and let me ask you this. Um, so let me, let me see if I can take this one step further than uh, I was thinking about. Oh, good, perfect. So what's the, what's the let me start it off uh, like this. A1x dy dx plus A0xy g of x. There's your general first order linear. Now, if that function was uh, uh, zero, right, then it's also, uh, okay, but it, it's also separable possibly, right? I mean, so, so it could be first order linear, but it could also be separable at the same time. So when you have multiple forms something's in, you can choose the way to do it that's easiest. That kind of makes sense. But then the whole idea about what to choose, which way is easiest, sometimes is itself a problem. All right. And sometimes it doesn't really matter. They're all equally hard or easy. Um, so if I divide through by A1, I end up with, 
Oh, do I want to do this now? No. Yeah, yeah, sure. I got to do it for this. I don't know if you remember, we did this before. I'm going to divide through by a1 of x. I'm calling a0 by a1. I'm calling it a p. It becomes a new function. And the solution I find has to be continuous. So the solution has to be continuous. Uh, has to have p of x and oh okay and g of x I call it something else down there and g of x continuous on some interval i so whatever that function is whatever your solution is the interval on which it works has to have this continuous on it and this has to be continuous on it. Because obviously, a1 of x, if it equals 0, that kind of freaks that out. Right? If a1 of x is 0, that freaks the whole damn thing out, doesn't it? Do you guys see that? If a1 of x is 0, then the whole thing gets freaked out a bit. Right? There's not really any more a de. Yes? Uh, it says uh, p of x and g of x. Is this q of x? Or is it no? No. Uh, yeah, it's g of x. So p of x and g of x have to be continuous. Because to be honest, a1 of x could actually clear out a problem g has. Uh, p of x being continuous already means that a1 can't be 0. g of x has to be continuous on its own to begin with. OK, maybe, maybe. Um, I like it. And, and notice this. See, see how this is already? Now, now watch. This is the last thing I'll say, I promise. Because I promised you and me we'd leave a little early, and now I'm starting to push it. Um, this is already almost the form of a differential, right? This is uh, leave the function alone to get rid of y, leave the y alone. So if a0 of x equals what, then this is the form we want it to be in. And this is where I realize, you know, you guys are like, I lost a while back, but... Do you remember what we were just doing earlier, trying to make it all compact? So I wanted it to be the productal parts. So do you see how this is a derivative of y, leave that function alone, right? So this is really what I want. So if only a0 of x was the derivative of a1. So if a0 equals a1, can I just do that? Is that, is that cool? If this is true, then we're golden. So what I want to try to do, if that's not true to begin with, I want to try to figure out what do I multiply by to make that true. So believe it or not, there's a way to figure out that integrating factor to make that true. I just wanted to make sure that the, the idea behind why we would even look for this made sense. Because that's something that people always skip over. Let's just look for the thing. And, I'm, and me, I was always like, how would they even know to look for that or think about it? So this is the motivation by looking for that. What do I multiply by to make that work? And I showed you a specific example earlier. Okay. All right, that's plenty. Let's let's call it there. Yeah. You're gonna give us back those. The quizzes. Yeah, you're gonna give them back those. No. No, yeah, no, yeah. I've been yeah. Them back. I pretty much always give you quizzes back the next time I see you. So. I always hated the teachers that take like four weeks to give you stuff. Oh shit. Oh, I never post answers, to be honest.